Right, morning. Um, so, what I like to talk about is uh, not dysfunctional C++, but uh, the functional stuff. Um, because everybody seems to be talking about that now. It's a little overdue, uh, one would say. About six decades overdue. Um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, better, better late than never. Um, and everyone is looking at how they can either extend their respective languages um, to embrace more uh, concepts um, that we find in functional programming and indeed in other paradigms, but because um, there's been a bit of a, bit of a land grab. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that now goes under the functional bucket that's actually logic programming and so on. Um, but there is this idea that people are becoming a little more open to um, uh, sort of uh, broader paradigm ideas and there's a lot more cross-fertilization between languages. Now, any language that starts adding this stuff later is automatically at a disadvantage uh, from its heritage. So each language is going to manifest itself differently based on accidents of birth. It's, uh, uh, there, there are things that it will support better than other languages, and there are things in C++ that work far better than things in Java in supporting uh, functional programming, and vice versa. Um, and so what I'm going to concentrate on here is I'm not going to go hardcore functional. I'm just going to start looking, first of all, at what are the points of adjacency? In other words, what are the things that are comfortable for people uh, who may already be working in C++ and are relatively nearby uh, in terms of their reach uh, into the functional space and then take things a little bit further. In one sense, there's two, aspect, there's two halves to this talk and the second half is kind of the talk I'm doing this afternoon, thinking outside the synchronization quadrant. So apart from obliquely mentioning concurrency a few times this morning, I'm not going to explore that, although it's obviously uh, one of the motivation areas of motivation from C++ um, and a functional approach. I'm not going to do that because most of that stuff is going to find itself in this afternoon. So uh, just so you know, if you're wondering where this stuff is, why is he not talking about concurrency, there is a sp uh, specific reason to. Now, in terms of my background, um, I have a long-standing interest in terms of uh, uh, patterns, patterns as a way of thinking, not as a, a shopping list of um, uh, cargo cult programming that I should shove into my program. Every pattern is a problem-solving structure. So I generally approach things when people present me with new language features or new library extensions. Um, I, I, the, although there is a little bit of me that enjoys the technology for technology's sake, the little language features for their own sake, the, there's also another bit of me that goes, yeah, but why would this be useful? Is this a, is this a solution in search of a problem? And in many cases, we do find this to be the case. So I'm very interested in, well, why would I use this? What problem does this solve? Um, which, for me, characterizes uh, why I'm interested in different languages and paradigms. Um, but I'm also interested in the code level of things um, and uh, uh, why I um, uh, pulled together this book a couple of years back. Um, I've had a past in which I have been involved in the C++ standard, um, as well as uh, a couple of other languages and a couple of other um, uh, industry bodies. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off very, very simply with a very simple perspective from uh, Michael Feathers. Um, uh, you know, there are lots of different ways of characterizing different paradigms. We're only going to pick on object orientation and functional. We could talk about procedure, we could talk about logic, we could talk about AOP and a bunch of others, but let's just pick on those two. Um, and there are different ways of characterizing them. And I quite like this one from Michael Feathers. It, it fits conveniently into a tweet. Um, Object orientation makes code understandable by encapsulating moving parts. Functional programming makes code understandable by minimizing moving parts. And that's not a bad way of kind of capturing the respective ethos uh, of both of these things. And what we see with functional programming is this reduction of moving parts is very, very helpful. Now, that is obviously not something that is unique to functional programming. It is just strongly characterized uh, within functional programming. And certainly when I started um, working in C and uh, uh, C++ uh, extensively. I'd had the good fortune to have been exposed to um, a couple of functional programming languages, and I found that very strongly influenced my style around that second sentence, uh, that idea of reducing um, state change, localizing state change, uh, minimizing state change, very powerful concepts. So. Taking this into um, going to kind of the source of all functional wisdom, or at least Haskell programmers would have you believe that that's the source of all functional programming wisdom. Um, 
the simple idea, in functional programming, uh, programs are executed by evaluating expressions, in contrast with imperative, program where, uh, imperative programs, where programs are composed of statements which change global state when executed. One thing to understand here is that there is a shift in the terminology. Um, normally, when we talk about global state, we are talking about globally accessible via scope state, as in um, this is a global variable or um, uh, some, I, sometimes people say, well, we don't have global variables in our programming, uh, in our programming language because we're using C sharp or something like that. Well, yeah, you do. Statics, uh, public statics are basically global variables with uh, scoping etiquette, but they are still global. Um, that is what most people will refer to when they talk about global state. What is being referred to here is the overall um, accessible state of the whole program. That is, uh, that is how they view that. They're not talking about global variables here. Um, functional programming typically avoids using mutable state. Okay, so um, observations. Many programming languages support programming in both functional and imperative style, but the syntax and facilities of a language are typically optimized for only one of these styles. And social factors like coding conventions and libraries often force the programmer towards one of the styles. Now, I think this, for me, is one of the most important insights because people often will come into a language or a paradigm. They will look at the language and what it offers, divorced from its ecosystem, but also its culture, its social conventions. Um, I found this fascinating for quite a long time because um, in my in a long, long distant past, I, I programmed Fortran. And I remember when when people started talking about Fortran having modules and things added, and I was a little skeptical that some of the data abstraction facilities that have been added would be embraced widely. And that skepticism is actually reasonably well borne out because it's just not in the culture. That's not where the, as it were, the, the center of that language is. Um, and so we, what we find is that there are languages in which you can do a number of things, but people don't, either because of expectation, because of history, but also there's a strong pressure exerted by the libraries around them. And people um, sometimes find that they have to swim upstream in order to get the effect that they want. So what we see is um, the influence of all these other external factors, not just the language itself. I'm going to try and isolate the language a bit here, but I want you to recognize that this is what uh, kind of holds sway. So for example, a number of languages have had uh, lambdas or lambda-like facilities for a very long time. Um, but it was only, I mean, I'm going to pick on JavaScript for a moment. JavaScript kind of basically gave lambdas to the masses. Um, but it was really particular frameworks and particular styles in event-driven programming that really drove that into people's um, uh, common everyday uh, programming. If you look at the early DHTML stuff, very little use of um, this idea of anonymous functions being passed around. And then you look at modern JavaScript, the world has changed quite radically and also in, in terms of supporting it. So what we see is that some of these frameworks and styles and architectures will influence that. And we may see the same thing happening with C++ as the years unfold. Now, I guess the first question I ought to ask, because um, I know part of the answer to this, is uh, who here is actually actively using C++? So I can find out. Okay, has used C++ in the past? Right, okay. Um, uh, using C++ 11 onwards? Okay, so about half. Okay, so I'm gonna try, that's, that's quite a large uh, gap to bridge, because um, I know uh, Sean there is on the committee. Um, so that's, quite a, that's a bit of a span. So I will not try to keep all of the people happy all of the time. So if you sit there in curly bracket misery, that's just tough, you know too much, okay? Um, so uh, let's pick some practical examples, because people, people often say, well, you know, is anybody actually using this stuff? Is anybody actually using this to influence their architecture? Uh, plain and simple, yes. Um, this is an example from um, Facebook uh, in talking about how they built the um, uh, Moments subsystem. Uh, to keep our C++ API boundary simple, we adopted one-way data flow. The, uh, so first thing to observe, um, they are driving this from the idea of um, simplicity. So there's a goal here, they're not, they don't open with efficiency, or rather, they open with developer efficiency, not runtime efficiency. Their opening hand is, let's try and keep the API simple. Okay, let's try and make this easy to work with. Okay. Um, 
adopting one-way data flow. Basically, one-way data flow allows you to eliminate um, the challenge of interaction. Cha interaction is a non-trivial thing that we deal with in code. I do something over there, it does something back to me, and suddenly everybody has to know everybody else's state or know something about them. So there is an idea here of reducing the knowledge and coupling within the code. One-way data flow is simply a way of saying, I hand something off, and actually, quite frankly, I have no idea where it's going to, nor do I care. Um, so if you can structure code in that way, and we see this in the adoption of reactive programming uh, and so on, again, not coincidentally from uh, uh, Facebook, but that idea of being able to, I just pass it on and I really don't worry about it. I can have a very simple view of the world. I receive stuff, I pass things on. I receive stuff, I pass things on. Um, does simplify things radically. Uh, the API consists of methods to perform fire and forget mutations. So state change may happen, but if you don't know about it, your little bubble universe is um, effectively immutable. So there's kind of like sleight of hand trick that a number of um, functional programming uh, and functional architectures uh, actually achieve by saying, well, this piece of code doesn't actually know that there's a, piece, there's a side effect caused over here, and it doesn't affect it. It is not affected in that sense, as opposed to something like a classic observer um, uh, relationship where perhaps I send a notification, something comes back to me and says, well, what, did, what changed? Well, there's clearly a coupling between the two of us. If I send a notification saying, here is everything you need to know, I have no idea what this other party is going to do with it, this view, for example. So therefore, I have a very simple view of the universe. It's a, uh, a constrained one. My bubble is immutable. Change happens elsewhere if it happens at all. Uh, and methods to compute view models required by specific views. In other words, a view being um, uh, effectively immutable. To keep the code understandable, again, the developmental view, we write functional style code, converting, converting raw data objects into immutable view models by default. Okay, now we actually start caring about performance. As we identified performance bottlenecks through profiling, we added caches to avoid recomputing unchanged intermediate results. In other words, the idea is that it's a smoke and mirrors thing. We're going to support the idea of a simple programming model, and if that means we have to do more work under the hood, then we do more work under the hood rather than expose it on the outside. This is very different if you've uh, dealt with legacy C++ code. This is kind of quite different. Legacy C++ code has this very strong characteristic of um, mechanics on the outside, and that's what it feels like, that you're always combating and dealing with mechanics. The word simplicity is not the first one that comes to people's minds. The resulting functional code is easy to maintain without sacrificing performance. So there's that simple idea of this, these are the priorities, this is how we're going to reason about it. So I'm going to start off with just a very simple um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, having mentioned the observer approach, I want to look at how we can move around the um, move around the space um, and get get uh, sort of use this as a little bit of a way of exploring and flushing out a couple of C plus plus eleven features, as well as differences in era uh, in terms of how people would uh, approach C plus plus. So uh, it's winter, um, as I slid from the hotel over the uh, uh, paving stones to get here. Uh, it's a bit chilly, so therefore the heating system uh, is, is quite useful. And I'd rather not have to just turn on the heating system myself and turn it off manually. Um, what I'd really like to do is have a timer and uh, trigger it from a timer. So here's a timer. Uh, I'm going to try and decouple it. I don't want my timer coupled directly to um, the heating system. So in kind of meso era middle C++, the way I would do it is I'd just go to pick up the um, Gang of Four book and say, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decouple this using a command object, and I'm going to have a command object, timer, the command object will then go and run, turning on or turning off. And in fact, I have to do that kind of, yeah, so it's very simple. I end up with a sort of interface-like um, class, purely abstract. There's nothing else in that interface except perhaps a virtual destructor. Uh, and so we have this kind of ritual and choreography, and it, yeah, it kind of gets a bit boilerplate-y um, very, very quickly. If we look at this, I've now got a turn on command. I pass in a heating system, I remember the heating system, I override the execute um, uh, uh, function, and then I turn the heating on, so when it's called back, I turn the heating system on, and I have to remember the heating system so I've got private state. Uh, there is only one line of code that actually does anything in there, and everything else is just padding. And that's just turn on. So in the name of e enterprise coding, 
Um, we go and copy and paste that and just change a couple of things, and then somebody says, well, maybe we could use inheritance and factor out the commonality. It's just down that pathway lies keystrokes and boredom. There is no real benefit to this. This is a lot of work to get a very simple idea of could you please turn on at this time, could you please turn off at that time. The idea that, my, that the English is actually far, far shorter and easier to understand is definitely not working in this style's favour. Okay, so some people will then, realising that C++, um, you know, uh, they recognise, and this is the problem with a lot of C++ out there, is it's not really C++, regardless of whether it's C++ 11 onwards, it's C++. It's kind of like, well, yeah, it's C with a few bits of C++ thrown in and a little more um, uh, bits of library and a little more type safety. Um, they will reach for the void pointer. They will reach for how they did callbacks in C. And there is a problem here. Um, although I've tried to name this and uh, uh, use syntax that makes it as clear as possible. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to pass in a function and then I'm going to pass in the data that the function must operate. The only way to make this general purpose and decouplable in a statically typed language in this sense um, is to use the void pointer. Now, the void pointer is quite simply a way of telling the compiler, hey, thanks for your help, but trust me, I'll take it from here. You know, it, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, a sense that if, you're, if you've got void pointers floating around high-level code, it is not high-level code. Uh, the, perp the void pointer is there for a very good reason. This is not really it. There is also something else missing here. There's a coupling. It's an important idea. There's a coupling between the function and the argument that you pass in. The coupling is that they must be the right type. When you bind things together, when you have two things that are coupled together, we tend to call that a thing or an object. So in other words, what we've done is we've defragmented an object. Two things that naturally go together should be together. We're going in the opposite direction here. But for this, there is a benefit. There is a brevity. Um, you know, rather than having a huge amount of boilerplate, I've only got a tiny amount of boilerplate. It's as ugly as sin, and if, you're not currently, if you've not currently incorporated keyword casts into your coding style, um, they've only been around since the mid-90s, and I know the C++ world gets a little geological in its pace sometimes, but um, I remember having a discussion with somebody. It, they objected to the use of things like static cast um, as opposed to old C-style casts. They said, well, it just makes my code look ugly. And I said, well, casts are an ugly thing. Uh, they should not look beautiful. They should be, if you, they're ugly things, they should be easy to identify, and they should also be very greppable. Um, so, yeah, uh, we've got this. However, we are playing a little fast and loose with the type system. So, yeah, this is, this is a sort of a, a C-plus approach. Now, from kind of boost, the boost libraries, um, and Doug Greger's work originally on this through the uh, TR1, Technical Report 1, that informed um, quite a lot of the library uh, additions in C++11. Um, polymorphic function wrappers were added. The idea of a universal function pointer, effectively. Very simple idea. I can now point to a function. I can point to um, a member function. I can point to an object that masquerades as a function. It really doesn't matter. As long as I can call it like a function, then that's good. And I can pass it in there. So this idea of the universal function pointer being provided in the library rather than language, um, there's a sort of a tighter relationship we're going to see in a moment with uh, uh, library and language. Um, it, this is definitely, when it comes to standard function, it is massively convenient. Um, but I would say uh, it's a little bit like sausages, if you look at the implementation. Um, it's one of those things of, you know, many people enjoy eating sausages, but if they saw how they were made, they'd, be, uh, they'd definitely be uh, uh, less keen on it. Um, so don't look at the inside of standard function, just use it as a universal function pointer. Um, so what does that give us? Well, the simplest thing is that now we can actually, I'm now actually declaring two objects on and off, um, two timers. But what I've got here is I no longer actually have to introduce an intermediate abstraction. In the first command style solution, I introduced classes with a lot of boilerplate code. In the C style solution, I introduced functions, which still had a little bit of boilerplate and also played fast and loose with the type system. Here, I don't need anything intermediate whatsoever. The bind function does it all for me. Okay, basically, it's a partial application. Um, it takes the heating system turn on function and it binds it to the heating object. It takes the heating system turn off function, binds it to the uh, uh, heating object and for later execution. And that's what happens. So there's a really good decoupling here. We are now just working with functions effectively. Um, we can go a step further. 
and use um, C++11's Lambda syntax, um, where I simply just pass in. Now, this is where the language and the library kind of get, well, rather the uh, uh, language and conventions get a little bit closer together. Um, the uh, the function, function objects are surprisingly uh, efficient. Um, there's no real indirection going on with them. They generate, um, the lambdas actually generate simple function objects um, from the compiler's point of view. Uh, they're available for optimization. So they are genuinely objects. It's just that you cannot name or talk about their types meaningfully. Uh, and they're very lightweight. There's no, uh, there's no indirection, uh, no, no real indirection going on here. And this one works really rather nicely and is actually slightly um, tidier in some ways than the, uh, the bind solution, which was the, the kind of uh, the default way of looking at it. Now, when we look at lambdas, a lot of people will go like, hey, look, lambdas, that's, that's very functional. And of course, they are the foundation of functional programming. But it's also worth pointing out that this solution is both a good object-oriented solution and a good functional, uh, functionally influenced solution. Um, the idea that being able to pass a function around is a purely functional idea is definitely not the case. It's been uh, the idea of being able to pass a, a block of code around as an object has been present in, in um, object-oriented programming since 1967 with the first uh, programming language um, that could claim to be object-oriented, Simula uh, 67. Uh, it was possible to pass blocks of code around, but somewhere in there, that kind of got lost. And we're only just rediscovering it here. And if you take it to its logical extreme, this wonderful uh, observation uh, from William Cook uh, in a paper from about five, five, six years back on understanding data abstraction revisited, makes the observation that lambda calculus was the first object-oriented language. If you really explore this uh, in terms of what are uh, uh, lambdas with closure, um, you end up with a perfect object model. Um, although he's wrong about the year, it was actually older. Um, so basically, um, C++11 onwards allows you to program like it's the 1930s. Like, yes, back to the future. Um, but there is some joy in C++'s choice of syntax. Every language goes its own way. This is actually legal C++. Um, this is um, a lambda that takes no arguments and does nothing. And this is its execution. Yeah. So you can have great fun with this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's a legal character sequence. Feel free in your board moments to see other long character sequences of punctuation. You can have a lot of fun with this. Um, so take this a bit further. Uh, in 97 Things, there's a, a nice observation from Edward Garson, apply functional programming principles. It refers to func referential transparency, um, a desirable property. It implies functions consistently yield the same results given the same input, irrespective of where and when they are invoked. Now, we often look at this. Sometimes people approach this from the point of view of mathematical elegance. Um, but there's another aspect here, and this gives, us, this gives us the idea of reducing mutable state, because for something to be consistent in this way, you can't go around changing stuff. So function evaluation depends less, ideally not at all, on the side effects of mutable state. Now, I'm not going to advocate immutability for its own sake. I'm not even going to advocate it based on mathematical purity uh, or even fashion. It is quite simply... Um, to do with this. It goes back to a point I made earlier in terms of cognitive load, um, understanding, the ability to understand something. If everything keeps changing, you have to keep track of that as a programmer. And the more plates you keep spinning in your head, the more that are likely to fall. So this idea, very, very simply, is we can have this simple concept of flow, and that thing is exactly where I left it when something does not change. When I leave something, it does not change for reasons that are unknown to me or surprising. I'm not even talking threaded here. You can get all of this in a single threaded uh, program. The principle of astonishment, the um, uh, uh, principle of least astonishment, is often violated um, through such mutable state. So there's this simple idea that the last time I did this, I got this result. The next time I do, I should get the same result. Uh, it allows you to focus more on the code and less on managing the state. Uh, Bertram Meyer captured this by saying asking a question should not change the answer. Um, I can, I'm going to make a bold, bold observation here. I suspect Bertrand Meyer doesn't have kids because um, this definitely is not a child property. It's a property of mathematics but not of children. Um, but there's another observation that's sort of a, a follow-on, uh, which is um, asking, uh, uh, nor should asking it twice, ditto for children. Okay? Um, but there is this idea that uh, you keep asking the same thing and you get the same answer. There is a consistency here. Thank <laughs> you. 
So the most obvious entry point into C++ on this one is going to be something like const. And const correctness, um, again, is a, that's something that people find they struggle with depending on their background. Um, I have to say that through accidents of early exposure to functional programming ideas, I found it a very comfortable thing to slip into when I, worked, uh, uh, when I started working with C++, the idea, and, and indeed C, um, C89, the idea that I was able to say, look, this one shouldn't change. And I know it's not a hard and fast promise in a language that supports things like um, void pointers and um, memset. It's not a hard and fast promise, but it's a fairly good promise, and you can do an awful lot to have it supported and thrown back at you if you violate it. And it's also an act of communication that is enforceable. Um, but passing everything around, we also care about references. Um, some objects get quite large. We'd rather not copy them around by, um, uh, by value if they get too large, so therefore we pass things by constant reference. Uh, C++ 11 onwards allows you to um, use R value references uh, and therefore mitigate certain copying costs. Again, this puts a lot more load on uh, many developers if they're developing new abstractions, but I think one of the most comfortable things is that if you're using just standard library, um, this has been done for you. If you're passing vectors around and returning them by value, you are not paying the cost that you think you are by looking at the code. Uh, and this is a really important point because sometimes people will distort their coding habits because of anticipated or mythical um, uh, performance problems. But let's take this a step further. How do we isolate code for this referential transparency idea? One aspect is immutable value. Define a value object type whose instances are immutable. But C++ is a copy-based language. So although we care about this immutability at one level, there's another way of achieving isolation. And the other way of achieving isolation is by using copied values. Again, this is one of those things I want to pick up from a comment I made earlier about uh, the differences in languages and where they start from. If I'm working in something like Java, it's more natural to use this because Java is a reference-based language. Everything is pointed to. I'm passing everything around by sharing it. That's how I communicate. That's its default mode. This is actually quite uncomfortable in Java and requires um, programmers to remember to clone objects, and it's not particularly efficient. You keep hitting the heap all the time. So this is the natural way of expressing that. C++ has a default mode um, of saying, I copy. If you, if you name a type, then it gets copied. And that gives us a certain isolation. In other words, the idea that if I have... Um, if I am an object that has state, you ask me a question, I can return you a copy of that, and you can do what you like with the copy, but it will not affect me. Similarly, if it were immutable, I would have an isolation there as well. So there's this idea, these are two techniques for isolating things. Make a copy of something, um, or make it unchangeable. It's something I'm going to pick up um, th this afternoon. So from a C++ point of view, I'm going I'm to pick on um, my old favorite, the, uh, uh, the, the date class. Um, dates are always I, I do this for a number of reasons. One, everybody's familiar with the domain. Two, very few people are actually f really deeply familiar with the domain. Um, no, I'm not going to do a full date class. That's, that's great fun, but well beyond the scope of uh, uh, this talk. So there's only one true ordering for the constructor. Uh, I'm going to pass in three integers. I could use types to distinguish those, but that's, um, uh, that's not relevant to this example. But there's only one true ordering. That's ISO 8601, year, month, day. If you're using anything else, you're wrong. Okay? It's as simple as that. Um, there's three orderings, big Endian, little Endian, and middle Endian. Uh, middle Endian is what is used in uh, North America, and it's a reminder of why we have an Atlantic Ocean. Okay? It's, an, it's, a, it's an isolation war. Um, but here, uh, year, month, day... Um, I'm going to let the compiler default the copying uh, operations and others. Um, I'm going to get the year, get the month, get the day and the month, set the year, set the month, set the day and the month. This is, um, this is a kind of a habit that people have. Um, for every getter, they have a setter. And they don't even know they're doing it. In fact, sometimes we, we optimize doing the wrong thing by allowing IDEs and editors. It's like, yeah, generate me a pair of those. People don't even know they're doing it. When I run, when I run classes... I'm often fascinated by, you know, I sort of ask somebody, well, you've got a setter for that. Why is it there? Oh, I didn't realize I had that there. They don't even know. They just go into a kind of like a, a fog of just like auto-typing. I've, I've, I've got some data member. I must have a getter and a setter. I've even seen a coding convention that says for every data member, you must have a getter and a setter. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, an encoded way of doing, doing the wrong thing uh, badly. So, yeah, just because you have a getter doesn't mean you should have a matching setter. 
So I'm going to sort of, we, let's, let's tidy this one up slightly, and we'll have a setter. Let's treat this transactionally. Typically, you don't just tweak dates. You normally have something that you want to do. You don't want to go through intermediate states that are awkward either. Um, the idea is, for example, if I have the 30th of January, and I decide that I want to move this to February, clearly this, there's a sequence dependency there. If I try and set the month to February, uh, whilst I've left the day and the month at 30, then that's invalid. But if I swap the two operations around, then suddenly it becomes valid. And uh, in its case, well, hang on, this is a bit awkward. We don't want to get, we don't want to get that uh, situation. I want to treat the date as a whole. So we end up with a set. That's, a lot of people will walk into that. And you get today's date set like this. <coughs> what many people don't realize is they've already got this operation. We don't need this. We can actually restrict the mutability. In other words, what I'd like is the date class to be, <coughs> I'm going to leave one mutable operation. And it's actually the one generated by the compiler. Um, we've already got it. Yeah, it's called the assignment operator. If I treat the assignment as a rebinding, then everything else is about the object. It's about asking it questions. You get to create it. You get to ask it questions. And the only other thing you can do is assign, and that's, that's already taken care of. If you're worried about validation, the validation happens in the constructor. We don't need to repeat the validation code. Validation code takes up a lot of space when people have all these individual setters. And yet I can achieve exactly what I did before, but it's now simpler. But I can also take this a step further. I mean, we can, um, if we start playing around with C++11 syntax, we can start uh, getting it really quite light. Um, the only other thing I would suggest here on a point of... So, so this is kind of basically my recommendation. If you're going to start creating value types, where possible, don't have state modifiers. Treat them as, they were, as if the only operation that you can change is to rebind. In other words, treat assignment as rebinding. Um, but also, I'm going to say, get rid of the noise. Um, get something is an imperative with an expected side effect. Uh, this programming, this, this little naming thing that we've been doing, um, I, I found an article that I wrote in 1995 where I was complaining about the prevalence of people using get as a prefix. It has only got worse since the 90s. Um, and people use get as if it's some kind of natural query. But if you think about it, in English, that's not its role. Get is not a query. It does not mean go, go and do something without side effect. It does not mean ask a question. Okay? Um, we've ended up with this rather dysfunctional noise uh, uh, prepended to all of our functions. Yeah, if I get money from a cash machine, there's a huge great side effect on my bank account, disappointingly. If you get married, there is a state change in your life. Okay? It is not without side effect. So it's, it's not particularly helpful either. And so therefore, if you want to try and embrace a more functional approach, then I'm going to make a very simple suggestion. Stop using imperative names. Get is an imperative name. If you want the code to feel functional, you've got to get your head in the right space. Language is strongly influential. And what's interesting is the minute I drop the get, this simultaneously becomes better functional code and better object-oriented code. Yeah? We get rid of the object-oriented assembler that plagues so many code bases. OK, so that's great if I want to change the whole date. But normally people don't want to just change the whole date. And they will object to this and say, well, look, that, I, I see what you're doing there. But actually, I do want to just change the month. I want to deal with the first of every month. I want to cycle through the month. So I really just want to change one field effectively. Well, OK, uh, let's do that. So what we're going to do here is um, we're going to just say, OK, I want that date with the year as something else, or with the month as something else, or with the date day in the month or something else, rather than change that state, we ask a question. What would the day be if we did that? Um, so this style um, is kind of the builder style. We see that in a number of fluent APIs. Uh, it's very, very common, but it is sometimes it's not been as embraced in this respect as I, as I think um, uh, it could be. People often use it really for building complex option objects. That's where they think about it. Uh, or creating full DSLs. But I'm going to say that every small class, every single value type is its own little language. Um, you need to kind of explore this idea of how do I talk about the uh, values and their relationships. That's what you want to talk about, the relationships between values. Hence functions, that is what they are. Um, so we end up with a style that um, looks a little bit like that. Um, and should we not wish to 
re-invoke the constructor, which that call is doing there, if we, should, if we wish not to re-invoke the constructor, if actually it turns out that the result of the operation is exactly the same as the current date, then we can put that in. But the point is that that's hidden behind the scene, and we can elaborate it with year, with month, with day, month, and so on. So we end up with some very, very simple styles, um, and it's really a case of what we need to do is when we say, we often talk about abstractions, we say, um, for my data types, for the values um, uh, and knowledge that my code has during runtime, what are the things I can do with this object? And perhaps do is a bit misleading. That's a very strong imperative, and we tend to default to thinking about um, uh, the idea of uh, do having a side effect. And we think of many objects as being state machines, which has its value. But perhaps a different way of approaching this, particularly for value style objects, is to not think about doing, but what, uh, put it another way. Um, what questions can I ask of this? What conversations can I have with this object? And that puts you in a slightly different frame. Uh, and you're less, you, you end up not dictating the terms of things. You end up having a, a reasonable side effect free conversation um, that is based on transformations, which is exactly what's going on here. Now, as you're fully aware, most code doesn't just deal with date examples. Um, you normally have, in fact, most, most, most state in code is inside uh, collections, inside containers of things. How does this kind of thinking apply to that? Because sometimes people feel they hit a brick wall. It's, yeah, I see the individual values. I can support these immutable ideas. I can have this idea of a much more pure style. But I need containers of this stuff. I need vectors of this stuff. I need maps of this stuff. Um, so here is the question. Um, containers. How do we do this? So I'm going to imagine, so this is not a real library. I'm just going to sort of put this out there. As a, I mean, I've doodled around with this on my, uh, uh, on my machine in the past. I'm just going to put this one out there. As, here's an idea. Uh, I'm going to joke, uh, you know, jokingly call the FTL um, uh, functional uh, template library as opposed to the STL. What would be involved in such a thing? If I were to adopt a functional style, what would be involved? Uh, well, I'm going to have um, all my value types. Uh, if you ask for the value types, it's always going to be const. Um, iterators, we only have one iterator type. There are no const iterators, because there's no difference between a const iterator and an iterator. Keep everything really simple. Um, you can ask a container if it's empty, its size, the begin, the end. The only non-const operation we're going to offer is the assignment operator. And again, I'm going to use the philosophy of rebinding. OK, what's that going to look like? We're basically saying the container's not going to change. Well, I'm going to pick a very simple example to start with, um, a set. Um, and this is a truly immutable set. Once you've set it, you cannot change anything. And there's nothing else that you can do with it except ask it questions, and relatively simple questions here. Um, I'm going to choose a, uh, a, a, an optimal representation in the sense of I'm going to uh, represent it as an array of its value members. Um, therefore, it's very cache friendly. Uh, it's going to be in sorted order, um, therefore compatible with the idea that you find the set in the STL. Um, and you can find things, you can count things, you can, you know, uh, 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 you can do the basic search operations. Um, and we can initialize it. I'm going to use the C++11 uh, initializer list uh, form there. In fact, that's essential to this approach. I don't need a builder approach to build this. I'm basically going to say this is great for reference data. In other words, I have a set of things that's never going to change, and I would just constantly like to just check whether something's there. There's no tree structures involved. There's no hashing involved. This is very, very friendly and very fast to look up. I just can't change anything. Nonetheless, there are cases, even in regular code, where um, without transforming, when I say regular code, I mean regular C++, where this uh, turns out to be useful. Let's look at another example. Let's have an array. An array actually looks very much the same, uh, but I can index into it. Um, and again, this is completely immutable. Um, once you've set the array, you cannot change its content, its size, or anything like that. And this is logically similar to the C++11 um, array uh, template, which is actually mostly useless, I've found. Um, uh, part of its reason uh, for existence was to allow simple uh, initialization, but we find that it's less useful than uh, we hoped. OK, this is all good, but you're, you can see that this only applies to a very, very restricted range of things that I want to do. I really have to know the values that I want uh, when I create an array or a set, and I cannot change them. I cannot change anything about it. There's no transformation here that is going to be cheap. 
So how do we get around this? Well, I, I don't propose to give you a, um, a full introduction to persistent data structures. I'll give you a, a light introduction to persistent data structures. Uh, persistent data structure is a data structure that always preserves the previous version of itself when it is modified. Such data structures are effectively immutable as their operations do not visibly update the structure in place, but instead always yield a new updated structure. There is a sleight of hand here. In other words, there's a very a neat trick that we're basically saying, if you hold a container and somebody else comes along and maybe pushes something into it or pops something from it, they will get a version of that that is the popped or the pushed version, but you will retain your version, you will retain your view. They will actually get a effectively new object but the way that it's done is that nobody can ever prove, without a debugger, that actually new stuff and side effects happened. Okay, it's a, it's a beautiful illusion. Um, not to be confused with the other use of the word persistence. Although, that said, there is an interesting idea that I observed um, uh, recently that persistent data structures, we often talk about them in terms of concurrency, but even without concurrency, they make sense because they are all about decoupling um, uh, temporal decoupling, decoupling state across time, whether that time is affected by concurrency or whether that time is later points of execution. They are bound um, in the same, uh, uh, same sort of ethical set. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at a simple vector. Um, this vector is based on contiguous memory, as the name vector implies. Um, we're, uh, contiguous memory and um, usual operations, empty size. It's array based, as we can see down there. I can subscript, I can ask the front and the back, and I can get the raw representation. Um, but there are two apparent modifier operations, or modifier-related operations, pop front and pop back. Um, these are constant time operations, and I'm going to maintain the ethos of the STL. These are constant time operations. Uh, and so it turns out that unlike the STL, um, the, there is a pop front here that can be done in constant time. So similar philosophy, but we're going to see the operation set is slightly different. But for just one moment, I'm going to concentrate on this. Um, I'm going to change the names um, because those names have a radically different effect. If somebody comes from the STL and looks for pop front, they're going to be surprised that this does not do what pop front um, expects, they expect it to do. Pop front should change the state of the current object they are working from. That is an expectation that has been set um, since the early 1990s. Um, but it also, there's another point here that I mentioned earlier. If you want to, you know, pop back is an imperative. What I'm asking really is something different. This vector, I would like to see the popped front version. It's more of an adjective driven phrase than a verb driven phrase. So I'm going to use a different but clearly related name, but also one that is not an imperative uh, to distinguish these. So you get back, now you get back a new vector, is that, is that going to be expensive? Well, not, not really, um, um, because what we've got here is in the representation, we've got um, basically pointers, iterators, showing you where the beginning and the ending are. And so therefore you can pop front and pop back to your heart's content and share the representation. All that's happening in each pop, each pop front and pop back operation is a return of those three, a return of the anchor and the from and the until. And that's all good. So what's this looking like in memory? It's going to look like this. I'm going to end up with, say, a variable A. We initialize our vector with four values. B equals A. Okay, we're now aliasing. Now, an important point here, and one of the things that C++ favors in contrast to a number of other languages, um, is that I can maintain the solution quite successfully thanks to the use of const. Um, because I've said that it only contains const values, there's no way that B can make changes except by doing the extreme violence that is available to us in C++, but that's generally visible through casts. Um, but there's this idea that actually by default there is nothing that somebody can do to change the view that A has of this. This is very different to something like Java, JavaScript, and most C-sharp stuff, um, where by default you have no ability to say, by the way, the contents of this cannot change. The best you can do is offer a comment, please don't put objects in here that could be changed via other means. The point here is that we've actually got a type level guarantee um, uh, about how we work. It does, it does work with the way that we work. Now. More interestingly is what happens when we pop it. C equals A pop front. We get back the version that looks like this. As far as the user of C is concerned, they've now got a new vector that is only size three. The user of A does not see any change. B sees the same thing as well. 
That's great for popping, but sometimes we want to push. Now, the only way to get that sorted is to use a linked representation. So we can, uh, uh, we can link this out, and we can end up with A. We can do the B thing again. We can do the pop front. But now this is the great illusion. Um, if we push, then what we end up with is um, a new prepended head. And if somebody else pushes on the front of it, you end up with a rather beautiful tree in memory. Um, the idea is that everybody's sharing representation, and there's no side effect without doing violence with the type system, there's no side effect that they can induce uh, that will undermine this illusion. So the representation sharing, that guarantee, uh, that gives us some kind of guarantee of immutability is absolutely profound uh, in this. It's also not a new idea. Um, uh, this idea is uh, really rather old. Uh, I quite like old books. This is my copy of uh, the Lisp 1.5 programmer's manual. Uh, it was originally published in the early 1960s. Um, it turns out we knew this in the past. Uh, I did have a brief obsession, well, two brief obsessions with Lisp at different points in my programming career. Never, never, never programmed commercially, but uh, I did uh, point out I have a deep fondness for the Lisp model. It is simple, elegant, and something with which all developers should have an infatuation at least once in their programming life, because it will change the way that you think. Just have a, you can have the infatuation in private. You don't have to make it public. Um, you, can, you can do that, and you know, if, you, if you think Lisp's a bit old hat, go for closure. Uh, uh, yeah, nobody's watching. Um, so, uh, there is this. However, um, and actually, uh, this is part of an article series that I wrote uh, when I was uh, writing for the um, uh, uh, C++ plus plus Users Journal. Uh, it's also a timely reminder. I was always told, never write articles that have part numbers in them. Um, I used to, and I, I had two columns for different magazines where I submitted such and such part one. And the editor came back and said, I'm going to change that title. I said, why? He said, well, I don't know that you're not going to get run over by a bus uh, or that we're not going to fold as a magazine or that you never submit the second part or something happens. You know, just it should look reasonably self-contained. So the only time I've ever successfully published something that's called, that has part one in it is this one. And I've never wrote part two. Um, so I left people hanging there for a bit. And in fact... There's, uh, and I wrote as this class called, uh, there was a Lisp. I was very pleased with that, the idea of a Lisp that is Lisp-like in C++. Uh, very, I probably put more effort into the name than anything else. But there is an important point there. There is a dangling reference here to part two. Part two never existed. Um, and this leads us into one thing. If you have been watching this closely, you, you may have noticed there may be a little problem. Let me just show, let's just show what the list Let's just reclaim the idea of a list, which is effectively a forward list. Um, this is how we might represent it. Um, that list that I showed you um, that, is, uh, that, that holds um, uh, const values. There's popped front and pushed front. There's no back operations. And we've got the classic kind of linked structure in there. It's a singly linked list. Um, I, th I put the length in there because you can actually reliably hold on to the length here, whereas that's not the case with forward list. Um, in uh, the standard. But if you're watching carefully, there is a little bit of a problem. That problem is that in not, not a single one of the slides that I have shown you, have I talked about, there's this question, I've got raw pointers here, have I talked about the question of um, memory management, which is the, the, you know, the, classic, the classic issue uh, that people are going to come to with data structures such as this. Um, and so there are basically two philosophies, um, and two philosophies of how you deal with uh, objects you're no longer using. Um, and it turns out that Shakespeare um, carefully and cunningly coded these two philosophies into Hamlet. Now, you thought that this was the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. Actually, this was a discussion about memory management models. Very cunningly encoded. Hamlet favors garbage collection. Yay, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial phone records. He favors that kind of approach. Now, where does C++ stand on this one? That's an interesting one. Um, and there is a, funnily enough, I'm, I'm kind of glad Sean's in the room, because um, we were on a panel in Las Vegas 10 years ago, 11 years ago? What was it? Yeah, something like, it was another decade. It was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and there was a question about the future of C++ and what things you should you see added. And that was in those heady days of optimism where people actually thought that um, uh, C++ OX 
uh, the value of x would actually be decimal and there would be a 2008 or 2009 standard. Um, but I mentioned at the time, I said there are four things that if C++ is to be considered a systems programming language, which is its heart, its center, as it were, if it is to continue to be considered a systems programming language, then there are four things that it must have. One of them is concurrency. It must be able to support a threading model because systems support threading models increasingly. Therefore, having a systems programming language that has no view on this um, is ridiculous. So I said that's an absolute must. Um, another one was dynamic loading. Um, because, again, um, operating system architectures have been doing this for decades. To have a systems programming language that does not have a consistent philosophy of uh, dynamic linking, again, does not make sense. Third one was um, a decent system of reflection. There are in large classes of architecture that are enabled and simplified um, through the presence of reflection. And these have become increasingly common. Um, Plug-in architectures, it's one of the things that is, you can always tell there's a difference in terms of how maybe a C++ programmer versus um, uh, a Java or a C-sharp programmer will approach something in terms of framework design. Um, and one of them is the availability of reflection, just opens up large classes uh, uh, of simple approaches to architecture. And that was missing from C++. And the fourth one, was garbage collection. Increasingly, systems have a garbage collector. Um, we saw this at the time with .NET um, having a C++ binding and uh, the workarounds that were enabled for that. So those are my, those are my f that was what I basically said. This, the language really needs to have these to, be, uh, to, to, to make it into the future. Well, we got the threading. Uh, the dynamic linking is kind of happening. A little bit later than expected. The reflection is nowhere to be seen. What about the garbage collection? Well, yeah. So, Bjarne sums it up on the C++11 FAQ on his, uh, uh, on his homepage. Garbage collection is optional in C++. That is, a garbage collector is not a compulsory part of an implementation. C++11 allows you to have this. Actually, it doesn't. It does not allow you to have it. <coughs> it allows the vendor of the C++ compiler to have it. That's not the same as you. And there's this very subtle difference. It basically means you cannot write a program that is portable and relies on garbage collection. You have no control. I don't mind the idea that it's optional, but it's no longer under programmer control. I cannot therefore reliably, all that code that I wrote before where I wasn't managing the memory and all the other slides, if this assertion is satisfied, in other words, we have Garbage, strong garbage collection. If we have that available, all of my code works. If, it, if it, we don't have this available, I've got memory leaks everywhere. And I can't ask for its availability. It is not a feature I control. It is a thing I can answer. So we have a little bit of a problem there. It's, it's almost worse than not having it at all. It's a bit of a halfway house. So we're back to Ophelia, it turns out, whose philosophy is more classically C++. It is in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. You're going to have to manage it yourself. Now, for a lot of people, Managing it was always a bit of choreography, and C++11 came along and said, you know what, you don't have to worry about this. I'm going to give you um, a smart pointer for reference counting, the shared pointer. Great, that kind of works. A couple of little caveats is that you have to provide your own deleter if you want it to delete an array, but you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's not entirely unreasonable. But we also have to re respect there's something else. Um, shared, having a reference counted pointer is um, there are a surprising number of inefficiencies. It can be efficient in some cases, but there are some surprises. Um, Rob Murray observed this a long time ago um, in C++ Strategies and Tactics. He said his observation from an implementation point of view is certainly, uh, certainly sound. Um, a use counted class is more complicated than a non-use counted equivalent. All of this horsing around with use counts takes a significant amount of processing time. It is not cheap. Okay, there is a simple point here that garbage collection run asynchronously, modern garbage collectors running in uh, different threads, they will be intrinsically potentially more efficient. And there are different classes of efficiency you may care about. Um, but if you are always hitting um, uh, something and expecting to increment and decrement a count, that's gonna pay, uh, you're going to pay a cost for that, particularly in a threaded program. Okay, there's, uh, it turns out that... Um, if you can guarantee your code is single-threaded, this is just going to be a simple plus-plus or minus-minus. 
If you can't guarantee that, you're going to end up with an interlocked incremental decrement. If it turns out that your object, the object that you are sharing, is only shared within one thread, that you will still pay the interlocked increment and decrement a cost. You have no way of signaling to the compiler, by the way, I'm not actually sharing this between threads, so go with this minus, minus, plus, plus. So there is a bunch of costs here. We haven't really taken it away from the programmer. There's also an additional memory cost. Um, there's an, a separate allocation in this case, unfortunately, because we can't uh, use make shared. So there's a bunch of stuff here. It's not as efficient as people uh, would like to think of it. And then there is a, what we might consider to be the ultimate showstopper. If I put it into that list class that I showed you, I mean, the, for the vector um, uh, class, it works absolutely fine. There's no, real, there's no problems with this other than the ones I've outlined, uh, which probably won't be too problematic with uh, uh, this, the usage of this particular uh, type. Um, but if I go to the list, there is genuinely a problem. If I transform those raw pointers into shared pointers, we have a problem. Uh, that problem is a very subtle one and uh, can lie hidden. It's not that you can't solve it, it's just that you have to solve it. And this is the problem. Um, we're going to have a list of stuff. It doesn't really matter what the stuff is. It'll be a list of integers, a list of string. That is not relevant. I'm now going to fill that list by doing a push front. I'm going to push for, I'm going to basically uh, add all of that. Um, I'll have to do a little extra adaptation because it won't know about pushed front. Um, uh, but um, if we do, if we tweak around with that, then we would hope that we would be able to create, let's just add a thousand items. We end up with a chain, we end up with a list of a thousand links. That's absolutely fine. Each one of which has a shared pointer pointing to the next one. So there's, uh, this is all good, except for one small problem. I've put the curly brackets into this example to highlight the fact that chain goes out of scope at the closing curly goes out of scope at the closing curly, which means that the destructor for chain will be called. Now, this is a linked structure, so we've got, a, we've got a pointer to the head. The destructor for the head will be called. It is referring to one other object, so its count goes to zero. It's going to refer to another object. Hey, guess what? You need to go as well, because my destructor is executing, and we end up with this down the chain. That's great, except that it's a recursive call. It turns out this blows, blows your stack for surprisingly small values. You should be okay with 1,000, but around 2,000 it blows up, which is a trivially small list. This is a problem. Now, it's not that you can't solve it, as I said, and this is the problem with the C++ community I find at times, is that, hey, I've got a really clever technique. The fact that you need a clever technique and you need to see this is actually the problem. This is a problem that garbage collection solves um, out of the box. You, have to, you cannot just simply have um, a simple persistent data structure, um, which is frustrating uh, from this point of view. Uh, you can have trees, but you're going to struggle with actually long chains. Um, so this is frustrating. The plus side is that we get to use const, which means we can ensure something about representation sharing, but there is a complexity cost, uh, a cognitive complexity cost, and code complexity cost um, to dealing with uh, reference counting as our default way of trying to manage sharing. So, I'm going to wrap up with an uh, observation from uh, John Carmack, um, the, uh, the, the games demigod. Um, no matter what language you work in, programming in a functional style provides benefits. You should do it whenever it is convenient, and you should think hard about the decision when it isn't convenient. You may find you cannot adopt all of these techniques, or even the superset, because obviously I only covered a subset of ideas here, um, in your code. Uh, if you're already using STL, um, extensively and uh, you've been shying away from functional objects, now is the time to kind of go back and revisit that. You will find that the STL design was informed um, quite extensively from uh, Alex Stepanov's experience with Scheme. It has a very strong functional overtone. It's not necessarily fully functional, but there's a lot of stuff there um, that uh, 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 gets you thinking in a, a very different way from the kind of classical um, C++ approach and even traditional um, STL usage. Once you've got, um, once you start using lambdas and um, binds and polymorphic function wrappers, that gets, uh, that starts achieving an awful lot more in terms of this expressiveness. But 
it's not just on that side. It's not just a matter of liberally sprinkling const over your code. It is about shifting the idea of this object, doubting you should open with any, any discussion with an object, you should open with the, a strong doubt that you need to change um, its state. Okay? You should seriously doubt that that is a reasonable thing to do. You should use that as your, as your position of design until otherwise proven. Um, sometimes you will find actually that no, this is the right way of doing it. State change is the appropriate answer. But rather than choosing that as your default, um, you should choose it as, as the, the other answer. The default should be, I'm not going to change it. And I have a battery of techniques that will allow me to not change it. But occasionally you will come out, in fact, possibly quite frequently, depending on the age and uh, architecture of your code base, you will say, well, you know, I recognize that this would be good. Um, and I have thought hard about it, but it is not convenient, but now you know, okay? But you'll be surprised how many other cases can be moved over the line to something that is not simply functional for its own sake, but actually really rather simple to reason about and understand. So I'm gonna finish with a Russian word that has been incorporated into uh, the artist, artistic world as a kind of movement or philosophy, uh, Ostronani. Um, defamiliarization the artistic technique of presenting to audiences common things in an unfamiliar or strange way in order to enhance perception of the familiar. <clears throat> in other words, what I've done here is taken C++ and um, tried to offer it from a very different perspective. People often throw phrases like multi-paradigm around, um, but uh, I, I want to look at it just from that point of view um, and show you where it fits and where it doesn't and perhaps some uh, new ideas. And I hope that has been useful. Thank you very much. But I'm standing here, so if you want to ask me questions, come up and ask me questions, then uh, that's great. Thank you.